Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the 26th meeting in 2017 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Uh, I would have liked the opportunity to have thanked Marie Todd in person for her contribution to the committee's proceedings, but that's not to be the case, obviously. Um, but we wish her well in a new role. And in Marie's place, we have we welcome Emma Harper. Uh, I'm sure you'll find the, your time on the committee, Emma, to be rewarding. And I wondered if you had anything to declare. Thank you, convener. Um, good morning, everybody. I would just like to refer <coughs> members to my register of interest in that I am a partner in the bed and breakfast business. Thank you very much. Um, as far as the normal process is concerned, remember to switch your phones at least into a process. I can't hear them. That would be very helpful. Uh, the first item on our agenda this morning is to take evidence as part of our consideration of the Scottish Government's LCM on the EU Withdrawal Bill, uh, and we're joined for this item by two UK Government Ministers, David Mundell, the Secretary of State for Scotland, Robin Walker, the Permanent Under Secretary of State for the Department of Ex Exiting the European Union. I'll welcome both Ministers to the meeting. Now, we're running a fairly tight timetable this morning. We need to conclude this session by 11am at the latest to allow Mr Walker to go off and appear before our Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, you lucky man. <laughs> 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 um, and obviously, I'm very keen to get questions, but before we do so, I just would like to give the two ministers the opportunity to ask, make any short statements they've got. Thank you, uh, convener, and it will be uh, very um, short. I'm pleased to be here today with the Parliamentary Under Secretary to support the committee's scrutiny of the EU Withdrawal Bill. This is an essential bill that will ensure the statute book across the UK is ready on the day we leave the European Union. The UK Government wants all parts of the UK to back this essential bill. We have been clear from the bill's introduction that important elements of this legislation engage legislative consent uh, process, and I very much welcome the scrutiny this committee is undertaking as part of that process. I acknowledge the current position the Scottish Government has taken regarding the LCM for this bill. However, there has not yet been a vote in the Scottish Parliament, and I remain confident we will reach a position which the Scottish Government and this Parliament can support. While the timing of any vote is, of course, a matter for the Scottish Government and Parliament, the UK Government is proceeding on the basis that a legislative consent motion will be tabled before the third reading of this bill in the House of Lords. In that vein, we are pressing on uh, with our engagement with the Scottish Government. The First Secretary of State and I have had bilateral discussions with the Deputy First Minister and Mike Russell to drive forward this work. In tandem, UK and Scottish Government officials will be meeting for technical discussions on the amendments the Scottish and Welsh Governments have proposed to the Bill. I have always made clear the importance I place on the scrutiny of the Scottish Parliament and the value that it brings to our legislative process. I therefore look, look forward to hearing the Committee's views on the EU Withdrawal Bill and will do our best to answer any questions today that you might have. Thanks, Secretary. Uh, thank you, Convener. As Parliamentary Undersecretary for Exiting the European Union, with responsibility for devolution in my department, I'm part of the team that will be taking this essential piece of legislation through the UK Parliament over the coming weeks. I appreciate it's a very detailed piece of legislation, and I'm very pleased to be here to support the Committee's scrutiny. We're still in the early stages of the parliamentary process, as you'll recognise, and the Committee stage for the Commons begins next week. Uh, I look forward to that debate and to addressing in that debate the detail of the various amendments which have been put forward. Um, of course, the Committee will understand we can't preempt too much of that debate today. But one of the main functions of the Bill is to prepare the ground for the great deal of technical detailed work that needs to be done to prepare our statute books in every part of the United Kingdom for EU exit. And that means essential work for the Scottish Parliament to help prepare for exit. It's in all our interests that we work together pragmatically to allow the Scottish Parliament to manage this. I'm very pleased to also have the opportunity, as you've mentioned, um, to discuss this work with the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee this afternoon. This bill and the work surrounding it on frameworks and to prepare our statute book are of vital importance to deliver an orderly exit from the European Union. And I greatly welcome this committee's contribution to that task. Thank you very much, both. Um, I want to begin with uh, what remains to be, the, obviously, the, the main stumbling block, and that's the, for the, the approval of the LCM, and that obviously it remains to be around Clause 11. Now, I'm confident that this Parliament, indeed this committee, uh, the, the Welsh Parliament and its committees want to see an early solution to the impasse that currently exists around Clause 11. As such, in my letter to Mr Walker on the 24th of October, I said, 
I'd welcome your views on what amendments to the bill the UK Government intends to bring forward that respects the devolution settlement. Now, given that both the Scottish Governments and the Welsh Governments have tabled amendments to the bill that removes Clause 11 as an obstacle to progress, the ball is patently in the court of the UK Government and has been for some time to lay out what it sees as an acceptable way forward. I sincerely hope you're in a position to do that today because that would respect the role and recognise this committee in its properly respected role. But more importantly, time's clearly running out uh, uh, and you may leave this committee with no alternative but to recommend that we cannot support the passing of an LCM in our report that we intend to produce before the end of the year. Uh, on that basis, uh, do you accept that Clause 11, as it's currently drafted, is unsustainable? Well, I'll um, allow convener, if, if I may, uh, Robin, to, to comment on, on the technical aspects of the bill because he will be taking um, that part uh, of the bill um, through Parliament. But we accept that we are in a, a discussion with, with the Scottish Government, that we're here uh, today as part of the, the parliamentary uh, process. As Robin uh, has said and indicated in his letter to you, amendments have been lodged. I think it would be wrong to preempt those amendments ahead of the committee stage uh, in the House of Commons. But what is happening uh, today and, and a, uh, ongoing is that there is a very detailed discussion between officials from the UK government, Scottish government and Welsh government to look at those amendments. The First Secretary and I made very clear to Mr Swinney and Mr Russell when we last met them that amendments put forward, and indeed those amendments put forward by the Welsh Government, would be looked at uh, very, uh, uh, very seriously indeed, because we want to take this issue forward. We want to be in a position that when the Parliament finally comes to vote on this issue, the, the, this committee, the Scottish Government, and indeed members across the Parliament are able to support are, are able to support the bill uh, for the reasons, the essential reasons that the bill uh, uh, faci uh, facilitates in terms of the of the statute book. I think we will uh, inevitably, therefore, disappoint you today if uh, you anticipate that we would give you a definitive uh, position in relation to particular amendments. We're not going to be able. Uh, we're not going to be able to do that. But what we can uh, and, and, and will do is to set out our commitment to work uh, to resolve uh, the issues that, uh, that you highlight. I don't expect and, uh, you to, to, to lay out what your view is on the amendments, because that's a process that's still to come. But I did ask, did you think Clause 11, as it currently is, is sustainable? Because that is the nub of what this is all about. And the quicker we, I think we understand what the UK government's position is on that, the better. So that was the question I actually asked. I, I, well, I, I think, the, well, I, I think the, the nub is, in fact, what is to happen in relation uh, to the 111 areas of responsibility uh, which are uh, returning uh, from Brussels and how uh, those areas are to be dealt with once uh, the United Kingdom has left the EU. I think that is a, an essential part of taking forward uh, these issues because if we're very clear in relation to what is to happen to those 111 areas, then that puts uh, the debate around Clause 11 in a context. And that's why I'm very keen to ensure that we take forward uh, that uh, discussion as expeditiously as we possibly can, so that w when uh, uh, this committee and indeed Par the Scottish Parliament, UK Parliament and others are considering the bill, it is in the full understanding as to what is the view in relation uh, to uh, these areas of, of responsibility, because I think that gives a context to Clause 11. Mr. Walker, uh, I mean, it might be helpful for me to just sort of set out some of the justification for the drafting of Clause 11 in terms of where it is now, but accepting absolutely the fact that we will be um, debating in detail the uh, proposed amendments, including those which have been backed by the Scottish Government, um, w w with regard to this in, in the coming weeks. Um, but 
I think, you know, as we leave the European Union, we want to respect and strengthen the devolution settlement in Scotland. And we expect significantly more powers for devolved institutions as a result of this process. I think it's important to recognise um, that Clause 11, as it is currently drafted, contains the orders in council procedure for releasing those powers where common frameworks are agreed not to be required. Um, and that therefore, um, it, it, it is, if you like, a clause which um, starts from the premise of the existing devolution settlements but allows for um, further devolution uh, as powers return from the European Union. Uh, and I think that it, it's in that context that we should um, discuss it. it. It's something that um, the, the frameworks discussion is absolutely essential, therefore, um, to seeing how this will work in practice, because we've already seen agreement in principle um, on the, the frameworks, which respects the devolution settlement uh, and which um, focuses on uh, what the, the principle that both the Scottish Government and the Welsh Government have accepted, that there will be a need for common frameworks in some places. I think moving forward on the detail of that, then, uh, is very important to ensure that we have a, a appropriate working for that clause. To put it a different way, do you recognise that if Clause 11 remains as it's currently drafted, you're potentially creating a constitutional crisis if we cannot get this resolved? I'm determined to get agreement so that we can get a legislative consent motion agreed by this Parliament. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm working to achieve. You and I, convener, have been round the houses on a number of issues where it's been suggested that legislative consent wouldn't be given for various reasons in relation to processes in previous Scotland bills. It's always been possible to find a way through. I believe that it will be possible to find a way through in relation to the EU withdrawal bill because both governments uh, certainly are coming from the same place where we recognise that there are areas uh, where... Uh, responsibility will be uh, directly and, and uh, as soon as practical uh, operated through from the Scottish Parliament. There will be areas which will be the subject of common framework. And in this process, actually, there will be areas where there will be some, dis there'll be some discussion. Uh, there will be areas where it might be, it might be a view that a framework isn't necessary, but some other form of, of, of agreement uh, is necessary. So I think we both have... Uh, you know, we both have a common objective, uh, and I think if we can focus on achieving that objective, if we can make significant progress in relation to the discussions uh, around the, the framework, then I'm confident that we can get to a position where we can reach agreement, and that is what uh, I uh, am I'm working uh, towards. That's, that is a, uh, the objective. Okay. Um, this committee will have to produce a report before the end of the year. Do you think this matter will be, in terms of what you've, in terms of the way you've laid it out, will this be resolved in time for our report being published? I couldn't give that. Uh, I couldn't give that undertaking. I'm hoping that we, you know we'll made have made significant progress by the next meeting of uh, the JMCEN, which is um, scheduled uh, before. Uh, which is being planned for before Christmas. I don't think there's a, there's a dis definitive date. But, I mean, we're very keen to expedite the process for, uh, for obvious reasons because I think that clarity, that context, will, will be vital to taking uh, you know, consideration of the bill forward. Finally, in Clause 11, in terms of its broader sense, why do you think it's required in terms of achieving the objectives of the government in the bill? I think the primary objectives the government has set out for the bill are providing certainty and stability at the point of exit. Um, as you appreciate, we currently operate under um, common frameworks under EU law. Um, and what Clause 11 ensures is that there is certainty and stability that those common frameworks um, remain in place, um, except in those areas where we've agreed that they will not be required going forward. Uh, and so that provides the certainty and stability that um, businesses, investors um, are looking for. Uh, it also, of course, uh, you know, underpins the certainty with which we can negotiate with our European Union partners. Uh, if the bill didn't have the capability to provide, um, if you like, uh, on these issues a, a degree of common frameworks, we would not necessarily be able to achieve the market access, um, which I think all parts of the United Kingdom want us to achieve in terms of our future partnership. Yeah, but why, why is Clause 11 required for any of that? 
Because it, where, where common frameworks currently exist in terms of the um, action of EU frameworks, um, they, they need to be able to be preserved in some form. Now, um, as I say, and as the Secretary of State has said, I think where the discussions going on between the governments about um, where common frameworks are required to be maintained and where they are not required to be maintained, it's quite possible for the scope of Clause 11 to be substantially reduced um, through agreement between the governments. But I think it is, it's important to recognise that we need to provide that certainty um, that we're able to keep those frameworks in place. Slight change of emphasis there. The scope of Clause 11 to be substantially reduced. Well, I think it's implicit that's, in that's, the that's, discussion that's around the JMTs. That the existing Clause 11 is not going to stand the test of time. I think what Clause 11 makes very clear is that the orders in council procedure can be used to release powers um, from the, sh the shared frameworks. That that is written into Clause 11, uh, and so the, the, the point being, putting that into action um, will actually reduce the scope of its impact. I don't think that's a controversial thing to say. Adam. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, and thank you very much for, for being, with, being with us today. I think it's incredibly important that UK ministers regularly attend committees in the Scottish Parliament to help us um, with, with, with these issues. So um, I share the Secretary of State's optimism um, that this bill can be legislated by Westminster with the consent of the devolved administrations. <coughs> Um, and I also share his determination to do everything that we can do to ensure that that does happen. We've talked a lot already this morning about the problems um, with uh, Clause 11 in particular. I wonder if we could turn to some of the solutions. The Secretary of State, you said um, in evidence to the House of Commons Scottish Affairs Committee a couple of weeks ago that powers will either be with the Scottish Parliament here um, or they will be subject to a UK-wide framework to which the Scottish Government is a party. That's what will happen. That's what you said. Could you I expand on that and, 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 and help us understand whether that's your interpretation of what Clause 11 currently says or whether that's your interpretation of where Cla Clause 11 will have to move to in order to obtain the consent that we both uh, want, to, want to achieve? I, I think I said in response to the convener that it's what's important is to make progress in relation to the framework issues uh, in order to put Clause 11 into context and, as uh, Mr Walker has said, uh, in order to fully understand its scope. So clearly, the maximum amount of agreement that can be reached as soon as, as possible in relation to which areas there would be frameworks, which areas there would be no frameworks and, which, and, and some areas in which there might be some looser uh, uh, arrangements, MOUs, concordats, would be very important. But I think a point that, uh, and, and I think one of the things I'm very clear, uh, I'm very clear about, it, and in relation to uh, you know, achieving uh, legislative consent, achieving agreement from the Scottish Government, is that that will not be possible unless we have agreed the process by which these frameworks will be agreed. Uh, and that is a very important thing yeah. that, now, that needs to be uh, done. We need to have, we won't be able, obviously within the time scale, to agree the, f the content of uh, these frameworks, but we will be able to agree how frameworks should be agreed. Now, and I want to put back on the record, which I did at the Scottish Affairs Committee and at Scottish Questions, that a UK framework is not a framework that is imposed by the UK government on devolved administrations in the United Kingdom. It is a framework that is agreed. Now, we have to have mechanisms by which we reach that agreement. There are different views have been put um, forward. Uh, I believe the JMC, for example, operating effectively is one possible route. But I, uh, we will be we will be seeking not just to get agreement on what areas uh, fall within frameworks, but how frameworks are agreed. And okay. I, I, you know, clearly this Parliament would want to know that uh, before considering giving consent. I mean that's very helpful, and it is you know very important to underscore um, the point that. It's the UK government's understanding that these frameworks will be agreed across the governments of the United Kingdom 
or across the governments of Great Britain, as the case may be, and not imposed top-down from Westminster. That's very helpful, and thank you for putting that back on the, on the, on the record. Can you... I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that... The, well, certainly I feel a little bit in the dark in, 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 the, in, in terms of you know, how, the, how discussions about how we agree these common frameworks are progressing. Where are these discussions taking place? Are they taking place at official level or at ministerial level or, or both? And, and, and how can the two governments, in your view, Secretary of State, ensure that committees such as this and indeed the Parliament generally is kept fully informed of the progress of these discussions? It seems to me that you know, we've been talking about talking about agreements for quite a long time and it might be now might be the time to advance that a bit more a bit more rapidly. I agree with you and I think you know we have we have made progress uh, lately. I, I don't I don't think it's you know it, 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 it serves any useful purpose at this point to, you know to go over why we hadn't uh, uh, made as much progress as no, we I'm might have hoped for, I'm before we got to here. Yeah. That, cause I, I, but, but I think both sides are committed um, now to going forward. So what is happening uh, right now in, in the next, uh, I, I think, uh, in the next few days is something which is call, has been called a deep dive and that is three areas involved. This has been agreed with the Scottish and Welsh governments. Three areas have been identified as requiring investigation as to what frameworks and devolution, uh, direct devolution, might look like. So the three areas which were take, which were taken as examples was at one, in, in, the, in, in Scotland, in particular, justice at one end, where given that Scotland has its own distinct legal system, the anticipation, and I should, should, should emphasise that word, the anticipation would be that there would be very few issues with frameworks in relation to the justice system in Scotland and those powers listed in 111, which, uh, um, uh, which uh, impact on justice. On the other hand, agriculture, where there are a large number of areas which might have a UK-wide uh, application, and that there would, uh, and in order, because the, because um, justice um, and legal issues are not separate in Wales, it was agreed that public health would also be considered because at that um, uh, at, the, at the request of the Welsh. So of officials from both, well, all three uh, governments at this moment are looking in detail at what the implications of uh, um, frameworks, non-frameworks, time scale, uh, uh, the structure of, of, of taking these issues forward uh, with a hope that they'll be able to come back uh, to the uh, JMCEN at its next uh, meeting to report back how that process has gone and then how we can take that forward in the context uh, of, of the other areas. So that's that's where we are in relation to a, uh, in, in relation to the frameworks. I want us to get to the position which I outlined in my initial response to the convener, uh, which I think is a fairly reasonable one, where there's an, a there's an area where everyone is in, in agreement that there wouldn't be, there would be no frameworks, and there would be a, a, a there would be. Uh, do, um, the, the powers would return as expeditiously as possible. There would be an area where everybody agrees that there should be frameworks, and inevitably there will be some toing and area, some toing and froing in some areas. That the governments may have different views, and there will have to be uh, a, a, a discussion in that regard. Thanks. Ash Wiener, good morning. Hi. I don't know if you've been able to see any of the previous evidence sessions that this committee has undertaken. Uh, last week, for instance, we had some academic experts in to give us their opinion. We spent, as you might imagine, quite a bit of time talking about Clause 11. I'll just uh, uh, give you a flavour of some of the um, comments that were made. Professor Keating, he said that the UK government had gone about it in the wrong way. And he said that he felt, in his view, the UK government could and should dispense with it. Um, so I guess the feeling was that it wasn't ultimately necessary. Now, Mr. Walker, you've just said this morning that you believe that the Clause 11 is necessary in order to meet the bill's objectives. But in my view, I just don't think it is necessary because the bill's objectives could be met using 
the existing conventions that are already in place, such as you know, the Seoul Convention, Concordats, agreements. These are um, tried and tested. They're already being used at the moment quite successfully. So I'd like to ask you, why is it that at this point, these mechanisms are now not enough? I think um, what we're talking about, let's not forget, is the approach we're taking to exiting the European Union here, um, to coming out from under a set of common laws, common frameworks, which we've had from the European Union. And we think that there is going to be a need in some areas to establish common legislative frameworks um, across the UK. Uh, Clause 11 gives the scope for that, but it also gives the scope, importantly, and through the Orders in Council um, mechanism, which is actually modelled on um, the approach taken in the Scotland Act for the release of further powers uh, and for, um, the, uh, for ensuring that as powers return, um, where there's an agreement that common frameworks aren't required, those powers can be um, handed on to um, the devolved administrations in those areas. So it is the aim um, of the government to establish common frameworks only where they are needed. Uh, and it remains our expectation that the outcome of this process will be a significant increase in the de decision-making power of each devolved administration. Uh, and, of course, you've pointed to some of the evidence that you've received, and we'll certainly take that on board and look at that and make sure that that's taken into account for the committee stage of the bill when we debate these things. But, of course, uh, you know, there's been a range of evidence on these things, and I know that um, Stephen Law's QC has given evidence to be exiting the European Union uh, select committee, uh, which argues very much that this is a, um, a, a framework which is required um, but that conversations between the governments, that the, um, the JMC process and the fr discussions around frameworks ought to be able to make its uh, approach limited. So I believe that recently the UK government and the devolved nations have signed up to a number of principles in the form of a letter. Mm -hmm. um, part of that was that the UK government has agreed that the common frameworks and so on will respect the devolution settlement. Um, I would say to you that I feel that this doesn't respect the devolution settlement and that the UK government has been aware for quite some time now that with Clause 11 as it's drafted at the moment, the Scottish government certainly will not be able to sign up to it. So I have to say to you, I find it quite startling that you've come here today, this morning, knowing that, and you seem to be telling me that the UK government still has no plan as to how to resolve this impasse. I... I, I I don't think you were listening with due respect to the evidence that I've given over the last uh, half an hour or so, where I've said that we're absolutely committed to finding a way forward in relation to this issue. We fully respect this parliament, the contribution this committee will make, the discussions, the detailed discussions that we've sought with the Scottish Government. Those discussions are ongoing. We're looking at det in detail at the amendments that have been brought uh, forward and that we have committed uh, to do that. We're looking uh, to expedite the, pr the process in relation to the frameworks, which I believe is uh, actually the nub of the issue, so that there is a context uh, to this process, so that people understand exactly in relation to the powers and responsibilities uh, that, are, uh, that are being brought forward, which of those powers and responsibilities will come direct to the Scottish Parliament, which will be the subject of frameworks and which might be the subject of some other uh, agreements. And that's what we're looking to do. We're looking to ensure that there's clarity on how those frameworks uh, will be agreed, that, that those frameworks are not uh, where there are UK frameworks to be imposed. They are to be agreed. I don't see how uh, you can deliver more respect than to say that the frameworks must be agreed in every in areas where there are not uh, frameworks, uh, the Scottish Parliament will have uh, responsibility. Thank you. Okay, now we're going, uh, we're supposed to, I'm still want to stick to Clause 11, where we'll get into the specifics of frameworks. Is it Clause 11, Patrick, you still want to go in that area? Yeah. Okay, when you go. Thanks very much. Good morning. Um, you said that you don't see how more respect could be shown to the devolution settlement. I'm not sure if those were precisely your words, but I think that was the, the meaning of it. But the, the consent you're asking us to give to this bill as it stands and to Clause 11 as it stands uh, is to consent to constrain the ability of the Scottish Parliament to legislate in devolved matters. And as you know, the tradition is that what is not reserved is devolved. Is there any reason in principle 
why matters that are not reserved and are currently not UK competencies should become UK competencies. Do you want to set out that? Sure. I, I mean, I think what we're talking about here is specifically um, where powers are held in common at a European level currently. And um, what we are saying is that the Cla Clause 11 is a temporary measure while decisions are taken on where common approaches are or are not needed. And I think it's important to look at some of the wording that has been agreed in terms of the um, actual outcome on frameworks principles from the JMC, which talks about the fact that frameworks will respect the devolution settlements and the democratic accountability of devolved legislatures and will be based on established conventions and practices, including the competence of devolved institution institutions would not normally be adjusted without their consent, maintain as a minimum equivalent flexibility for tailoring policies to the specific needs of each territory as is afforded by the current EU rules. So we're not talking about anything here um, which impinges on the current decision-making uh, power of the devolved legislatures or the devolved administrations. Uh, we're talking about areas where this is either currently uh, held at the EU level uh, and we're talking about a temporary measure but whilst we agree between ourselves, <coughs> between the governments, um, on the uh, appropriate places for uh, common frameworks. Uh, I think that's a, a reasonable approach which does reflect the devolution settlements as they stand and it's clearly our intention and we've, I'm very happy to repeat uh, our intention uh, that the outcome of this whole process should be an increase in the decision making powers of each of the devolved legislatures. You both keep using the word agreed that what, uh, what comes out of this at UK wide level including in some devolved areas will only be agreed never imposed. Surely the way to express the greatest respect for the devolution settlement, as Mr Mundell says he wants to do, is to ensure that this bill doesn't grant you the ability to impose anything. How can a negotiation take place in good faith between the different governments within the UK if the UK government ultimately has the legal power to impose a settlement uh, on, a, on a common framework where there is no agreement? isn't the only way to do it to ensure that you don't have the power to do that and agreement is required. I, um, I understand the point you make, but I, I, I think I've I, um, set out clearly uh, the basis on which uh, I, underst I understand a, um, that your consent would only be forthcoming if it was clear how, uh, uh, how uh, frameworks were going to be agreed. I, 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 I don't I, uh, think in any way I, uh, that a uh, consent, and consent uh, the de is a demonstration of respect, the fact that the, the legislative consent of this parliament is, is a vital component of this uh, legislation, I, uh, in my view, is a, is a clear demonstration of respect, as well as the commitments that we've given in relation to uh, how frameworks will be uh, agreed. I hope that we can, you know, continue to move forward in a mature uh, way in terms of the discussion and, and dialogue that takes place between the UK and Scottish governments. The convener uh, has, uh, over time, taken a great deal of interest in intergovernmental uh, relations. I'm quite happy to put my hands up to say that we haven't, uh, we, we haven't quite still got that right in terms of, of process, but we need to work uh, towards a, uh, continuing to improve the operation of intergovernmental relations. But this process is taking place with uh, respect both for the Scottish Government and for the Scottish Parliament. I don't mean to be ungrateful for the warm words. The warm words are nice. Mm -hmm. But I'm still not hearing a clear argument as to why this Parliament should give consent to a piece of legislation which constrains our ability to act in devolved matters or matters which are not reserved uh, and thereby give the UK government the ability to do something it says it doesn't want to do, of impose a UK-wide settlement in, an agreed, in, in a common framework when there's no agreement. If you're not going to do that, shouldn't this legislation prevent you from having the power to do it? What uh, I've said that we want to achieve before this Parliament considers whether it should give uh, consent is to give context to the clause by demonstrating what has uh, been uh, agreed in relation to uh, in, in relation to uh, the framework. So, as uh, Mr. Walker put it, the scope uh, of the clause 
uh, is, is fully understood at the time uh, that this Parliament has to consider it. I think there's a broader point here with regard to consent, if I may, which is that um, we are obviously we are seeking consent um, for the bill. The bill enables um, all parts of the United Kingdom, including each of the devolved legislatures, to stake, take the necessary steps to ensure the statute books are functioning properly uh, at the time of exit. I think that's hugely in the interests of all parts of the United Kingdom, and I think that's something which you know, we need to be able to do. And, of course, it is the case that the, um, the Scottish Government and the um, Welsh Government have signed up to principles which accept that there is going to be a need for common frameworks in some areas. So I, I, I think this is a question of, of how we move forward from here, recognise some of the concerns that have been raised. We will engage with those um, concerns around... Um, the, the Clause 11, of course, in the upcoming committee stage in the Commons. I can't make commitments at this stage with regard to um, specific amendments, as you wouldn't expect me to, but I think it's very important that we, we look at the fact that Clause 11 is not just something which works in one direction. It has the Orders in Council procedure there to enable those powers to be um, released where when, there when is the agreement that common frameworks ready. aren't required. When the UK government is good and ready. Where there's agreement that common frameworks aren't required. Uh, just... Finally, uh, Kamina, it does sound as though you're not ultimately going to ask us to consent to the bill as it stands. Presumably, once we know what you are asking us to consent to, you'll come and try and persuade us again? I'm always happy, Mr Harvey, to come uh, to this committee or indeed any other committee of this Parliament. Uh, thank you, Kamina. Um, Secretary of State, you, you were telling us earlier you're, you're working very hard to secure legislative consent from the, the Scottish Parliament. It is, in, in your view, uh, unthinkable that the bill would proceed without legislative consent? I think it's very difficult uh, to envisage such circumstances and uh, unhelpful to do so. Uh, we, are, we are committed to achieving legislative consent. I've been, uh, as I was alluded to in my uh, remarks to the convener, you know, I've been round the houses a few times uh, in relation to the first Scotland Bill, in relation to uh, the 2016 Scotland Bill, in relation to the fiscal framework, where throughout the, much of the period of the discussion of those, uh, of, of those uh, uh, pieces of, of, of legislation and uh, um, the, the framework, you know, we were told that, the, that legislative consent wouldn't be forthcoming. We were able to find a way through. They were all significant. They all had very significant impacts on uh, this Parliament, I, um, I, and indeed the, Scot the Scotland Act 2016, <coughs> as, as you know, was passed unanimously by the, by this Parliament ultimately. So, uh, I, uh, you know, that that's that's the the backdrop on which I proceed. You know, there's a lot of noise. There are a lot of legitimate concerns, and I listen to the legitimate concerns that are being. Uh, raised, but you know, my endeavour, rather than contemplating uh, negative outcomes, is on actually uh, achieving the result. And since the summer, we've made uh, significant pro progress. As I said when I appeared uh, before the European Committee last week, I do very much uh, welcome uh, the direct involvement in this matter of the Deputy First Minister. I think he's <laughs> brought his experience of uh, you know, previous involvements in the Smith Commission and the fiscal framework you know, to uh, the negotiation process, and that, that, that has been very uh, helpful. Okay, th thank you. Um, I mean, you'll be aware from what's been said previously, and indeed what's been said at the committee uh, this morning, that as it stands, uh, Clause 11 is a barrier to legislative consent being granted. Uh, are you and the UK government prepared to do what is necessary to secure uh, the legislative consent of this Parliament, including looking at amending Clause 11? As uh, um, Mr Walker has indicated, obviously I think it's uh, the fourth and f there are eight days set aside uh, for the consideration of this bill in the House of Commons with eight guaranteed eight-hour uh, sessions I, uh, and days four and five I think are devoted around clauses uh, 10 and 11. So there will be very significant debate, obviously, uh, on the floor uh, uh, of the Commons in relation uh, to, to, the, to, a, um, to the, the bill. Uh, what uh, I am a without so without prejudicing, you know, what might be said about the clause in that process. What I, the commitment I will give you is that I am prepared to do whatever is necessary uh, 
uh, to achieve consent uh, uh, from from Parliament within you know, within what you would understand to be reasonable parameters. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did you want to ask a question there yeah. on that, James? On you go. Okay. Sorry, before I moved on to Alexander and Common Frameworks. Sure. Okay. Just uh, just, just briefly, convener. Um, <coughs> you, I think you've been left in no doubt about the. Uh, the anxieties of the, the committee in terms of Clause 11 and the <coughs> need for you to make some movement in order to uh, get the support of the parties that will be required in order to achieve legislative consent. You outlined this um, deep dive exercise, sort of strange name for it, uh, and you also, just in your answer there, you spoke about there being eight days set aside, including days for Clause 10 and 11. What kind of time scale are you, you operating to in terms of this exercise, you know, the deep dive exercise work to uh, resolve the issues around Clause 11 and when this will be finally considered in the House of Commons? Robin can say more about about the, the, the timetable in, in, the, in the House of, of a, um, Commons. Um, what a, I, I can... Uh, describe is that in, uh, and I can, I can perhaps write to the, I can write to the committee in a little bit more detail just as, as to what what officials have done. But basically, it was agreed at the JMCN that officials would go from both the Scottish government, UK government, and the Welsh government uh, as well, uh, and they would look at the you know, and, and in detail at all at all elements of a, uh, these particular areas. One area being justice one area being agriculture and another public health, uh, particularly in reference to Wales, so that they had a full understanding of what actually would, uh, if there were frameworks, what they would, what they would, uh, what sort of form they would take, perhaps that there would be other mechanisms like concordats or, or uh, other uh, um, agreements, uh, and that they, that they will report back essentially to the JMCN so that we have a you know, we have a feel for what the exercise will involve. In parallel, what we want, uh, the position I want to get to is that we have an idea of which areas nobody is in any doubt would be uh, devolved immediately uh, or a, uh, within an agreed timescale, what areas everybody agrees should be subject to frameworks. And it's clear, there are, it's clear that that's not actually not that difficult a discussion. Obviously, it's, you know, in any discussion, there will be an area where there is, you know, there's a, there's a selection of issues where there are different views and they will have to be discussed and, and, and negotiated. Um, but that's sort of happening in parallel to, to the parliamentary process because neither Mr Walker nor I control uh, the timetable of the parliamentary process. And as, as I was alluding to the convener just before we started, particularly in relation to the House of Lords, as, as you may be familiar, there's no timetabling in the House of Lords so that we can't, you know, we could never give a clear idea of what the time scale for progression in the House of Lords uh, would be. But so I, I think what I want to try and achieve is that we expedite our processes as quickly as possible so that we're able to fit in with the parliamentary process, but we don't control the time scale of it. I mean, if I just fill out a little bit in terms of the detail of the timing, um, the, the second reading of the bill took place on the 11th of September um, after a two-day two debate. It returns to the Commons on the 14th of November for the day one of committee stage. Day two will be on the 15th of November. Um, the... Uh, programme motion which the House of Commons has approved will be eight days of committee as the Secretary of State said and with eight hours guaranteed for each day. The latest days of the committee haven't yet been announced and the process for that is that the Leader of the House would use their business statement on a Thursday to set out the business for coming weeks um, and the next opportunity to do that will be November the 16th uh, and so I think that will be something we would expect to be progressing with those crucial fourth and fifth days with regard to the debates on um, the devolution elements of the bill uh, within weeks but I can't give you more precise detail than that at this stage. Neil's got a supplementary, but I do want to get on to the common framework specific issues that I know Alexander wants to ask a question. Neil? In, in terms of dates, obviously, I don't know about the parliamentary timescales, but in t you mentioned previously that the GMC EN would be discussing the, the, the areas of overlap, the 111 areas of overlap. When is that, when is that meeting going to take place? At the moment, uh, it, it was... It, will 
uh, take place before Christmas, but we haven't we haven't got um, a scheduled a, a scheduled a date. But it, it will def it, it, it's in the process uh, to arrange that uh, to take place. So within the, within the within the period between now and, and, and Christmas, that that meeting will take place. I understand Emma's also got a, a supplementary in this area as well. Sorry, Alexander, we'll get to you in a minute. It's it's related to timetables and um, the passage of the bill and then the creation of secondary legislation. Now, the whole process has taken time. And, you know, in my recent conversations with the National Farmers Union, they're starting to get really nervous because, you know, the time to exit is, is looming. So can you comment on the secondary legislation? How would that impact um, as the transition period is, you know, upon us? I mean, I think that it is right, of course, that um, part of the point of passing this bill and creating the powers for secondary legislation is to make sure that we have time to put the necessary um, corrections into the statute book in time for our exit. And that, of course, is one of the reasons why we want to make sure it progresses, why we think it should actually be in the interests of each of the uh, devolved legislatures to give consent to the bill, because there are powers there um, for the legislatures themselves to um, get the, the secondary legislation process right and to have the, the correct scrutiny of that. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we want to move forward with this um, as quickly as possible, but of course we respect the need for parliamentary scrutiny in that process, and that's why a balance has been struck, <coughs> which means that we are getting on with the bill, we are getting on with the debate on, 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 on that as quickly as we can, but recognising we couldn't cut short um, the committee stage of such an important bill, particularly when we have uh, 400 um, I think it is amendments um, to respond to, uh, and so that's why we we, you know, we we have struck that balance in terms of giving it eight full days on the floor of the house um, and making sure that the government is able to respond to each of those uh, amendments in time. Um, but I think your your basic point is right: is that what we also need to make sure is that there is the time for adequate scrutiny um, in each of the legislatures of the, the secondary legislation that will follow. And of course, as you'll know, de delegated legislation is not legislation without scrutiny. It has to go through proper scrutiny processes. Um, and that does take time. So the sooner we can move forward with the whole process, I think the better for the degree of scrutiny that can take effect. And of course, depending on the powers in the bill, there are some powers um, which are sunsetted um, on exit day, but there are other powers that um, are sunsetted beyond exit day, recognising that there may be some areas um, where we will need to take action uh, after exit day itself. And that's, you touched on, uh, mentioned the issue of uh, transition and implementation. Uh, I mean, that is, that, that is, of course, a potentially a slightly separate issue. Um, it requires our negotiation um, to move forward on that front. We're looking forward to negotiating uh, on the implementation period, which is a very clear part of the UK government's position. Um, and um, it, you know, as we've said to the committee uh, in the House of Commons, if it's necessary to bring forward further legislation for that, we would. I think just uh, as, as a brief point, there, there will be a separate agriculture bill. There are certain aspects of leaving, obviously, the common agriculture policy, which can't be dealt with by secondary legislation. So the, the, there will be uh, an agricultural bill, and it would be anticipated that that bill would obviously require the consent of this parliament. Alexander. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Uh, good morning. Um, yeah, obviously good to hear that many of these 111 issues are going to be resolved through common frameworks and, and also good to hear from the Secretary of State that he feels that discussion uh, on those will be relatively, uh, identifying them will be relatively straightforward. So I just wonder, in, in point of moving things forward, how many common frameworks have you already been able to identify and in what areas? I think that's a variation of the name one power question, uh, uh, Mr. Burnett, which uh, I have uh, been uh, very uh, uh, keen not to do because uh, we are in, you know, we're, we're in a discussion uh, about a, uh, th these issues. We're in discussion with um, the Scottish Government. I hope that we can. Uh, make clear, as I've said in, in answer to other questions, you know, as soon as possible, the areas where everyone is in agreement that, that there's no need uh, going forward for a framework, those areas where everybody agrees there is, and perhaps an area in the middle where the, the, there's to be some uh, 
uh, uh, some discussion, uh, and maybe if a framework's not agreed, some other for some other mechanism is agreed. So I want to get to that point as expeditiously as possible. But I'm not. Uh, I declined uh, uh, in front of the European Committee. I declined Scottish Affairs Select Committee and Scottish Questions to give examples, and I'm afraid I'm going to do the same today. Um, hmm? Well, uh, yeah. Uh, we, 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 we've heard you know, evidence here of anything but range, number ranging between 6 and 12. Uh, would you like to... S 6 and 12 what? Uh, common frameworks. I th well, I, th I, th I think it would depend on the nature, you know, it depends on the nature of the frameworks. In, uh, I know that's a politician's answer, Confina, from the way that you, you, you look at me, but it, if, 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 you, if you cut me a little slack, if you look at, if you look at, if you look at the document, then... You know, something like 15, 15 areas begin uh, with the word environmental. So, you, you know, a, a framework in relation to environmental might cover all 15 areas. It might, there might be 15 frameworks. Um, that's, that, uh, you know, I, I think, it, 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 you know, there will be some discussion around what, what the structure uh, is. So, it, it's, not a, it's not a straightforward uh, as to say that, I, I, I like to say the reverse, and I've said it before, you know, is, is what it does mean that is in relation to areas uh, w of, of responsibilities that come uh, direct to the Scottish Parliament, there'll be a significant number. Thank you. Who want to ask supplementaries yeah. in this as well? Ivan? Convener, uh, thanks. Um, thanks for coming along to talk to us this morning. Before we go into common frameworks, I just wanted to pick on uh, upon something that Mr Walker said earlier. You said that we we're starting from the existing devolution settlement. I think part of the issue, um, and I just want to check your understanding of this, part of the issue from our point of view is that this, that's exactly not what we're doing because the key underpinning of the existing devolution settlement is that what is not reserved is devolved and this Clause 11 cuts right across that. So I, I just want to check, I mean, is that understood? I understand the position, but I think our understanding is that the competence of devolved institutions is currently defined in relation to EU law and in each of the um, existing um, devolution pieces of legislation. Um, the, the, the existing rules define um, devolved competence in, in, in terms of within um, the common frameworks provided by EU law. Uh, and so, therefore, um, we are starting from the position of, of keeping that settlement precisely the same and providing the tools through orders in council um, of actually making sure that those powers increase. So, um, I, I think I understand the position. I understand the, the concerns of where, um, wh where people are coming from on this, but our position is not the same. Okay, that's clear. Uh, uh, just taking that a wee bit further than talking about the common frameworks, you, you talk about the... Um the common frameworks are replicating the EU common frameworks. Now, clearly, there's a couple of EU principles in there around about subsidiarity and proportionality that aren't included um, in where we are starting from in a list of principles for the proposed UK common frameworks. Would you like to comment on that? Well, I think the um, areas where we function currently under a framework of EU law and then there are powers for um, the um, devolved legislatures, those powers absolutely remain in place. And so the power of implementation, the power of interpretation in that sense, uh, will not be affected in any way um, by um, this. Uh, but it is something that um, the, the frameworks that sit over the top are what we're talking about dealing with here. And as I've said, that will be dealt with through a mixture, as Clause 11 sets out through the um, approach set out to orders in council, of areas where um, there's agreement that powers should be released and should be um, therefore dealt with at um, the level of the whole legislature, and those areas where we agree that common frameworks are required. Um, and therefore those common frameworks will be dealt with at the UK level. But I think it's important to reiterate the Secretary of State's point um, that where uh, things, where the UK Parliament acts on behalf of the UK, that does not mean cutting um, the uh, devolved administrations and legislatures out of the process. It would be done um, very much in consultation. So I suppose moving forward from that then, what um, you, we talked about, you talked about, um, not imposed but agreed, in, t in reference to the common frameworks, what happens if we get to the point where there isn't agreement reached, given the timescales we're having to work to, which clearly are rapidly approaching? 
Well, given the timescales we're having to work to, I think it's in the interests of all parts of the United Kingdom to actually make sure that we have functioning statute books at the point at which we exit the European Union. That's, intre that's also in the interests of the deal that um, I think is in all of our interests to make sure that we have strong market access between ourselves and the European Union. Uh, and so I think, therefore, there should be a very strong incentive to reach agreement on these things. I suppose that doesn't answer the question, <laughs> which is what happens if there isn't. Well, I I think I, I have in, in the other um, uh, questions you know, set out that I mean, rather than focus on that scenario, we have to uh, work to get agreement. I've also said, and I'm very clear, uh, that I wouldn't expect legislative consent to be forthcoming unless we had an agreed basis on which the frameworks uh, would, would be, uh, would be uh, agreed. And uh, you know, I, I think that's, uh, I fully understand uh, that, uh, and I think therefore it's incumbent on us uh, to work through uh, to find a basis. Various uh, suggestions have come uh, forward as to how that might be achieved, and now we need to uh, put a significant effort into uh, uh, reaching a conclusion on that. Okay, thanks. I'll tease that bit a bit further, because effectively what I think you're saying, Secretary of State, is that's effectively agreement on the procedure. That does not necessarily mean agreement on the content of the frameworks. Or, or are you saying clearly today that the, you want agreement on the content of the frameworks and not to be imposed? No, it was the former. Sorry, I thought I'd made that because I don't. I do. I don't think that we can. I don't think that we within the timescale we're not going to be able to agree. Um, the content of the frameworks. What I've said in relation to the frameworks is the frameworks are not going to be imposed. We are going to find. We need to find by the time we get to the legislative consent uh, proce uh, process. We need to find the basis on which we all agree that frameworks will be agreed. The process that you go through to agree a framework. That brings you back right back to Ivan's question. In that case. If there is no agreement on the content, how will that be resolved? That because will be that 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 convener is a very important part of the process of well, uh, agreement. It is a very it's, it's a very important and that has to be uh, 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 that has to uh, that has to be resolved. Just, sorry, just run it back. I so just, just just so that I'm clear here. So you you expect then there to be a process for agreement of the content to be in place before there's an LCM granted by this parliament? I do. But not in, really, not in, relation, to the co uh, not in relation to the content of you know, what should be happening in relation to the environment. Uh, uh, an agreement in relation to how, if there was to be a framework, for example, and it is just an example, in relation to the environment, okay. how that framework would be agreed. Patrick, I'll come to you in a minute. I know you want to ask questions on this. It does beg the question, if there's so much emphasis on the frameworks being put by the UK government and probably by the Scottish government, why is there no mention of the frameworks on the face of the bill? Well, the face of the bill obviously does set out the orders in council process for making sure that where we agree common frameworks aren't required, um, those powers can be released. So I would say that is an implicit focus on the frameworks. Though that, that gives the, the UK government power to agree what powers it will eventually give back to the UK that come out of the EU. That's not the same as having a framework on the face of the bill. So why aren't they on the face of the bill, if they're that important? Well, what, what, what the bill is talking about on the face of it is retained EU law, where EU law um, returns. Um, and I would argue that the Orders in Council mechanism provides precisely what you're talking about in terms of where... We agree frameworks aren't required um, for then releasing those powers so that they come down to the appropriate level. Um, so that is written into the bill and um, it is focused on the treatment of retained EU law. Patrick. Um, I appreciate that you're not going to be drawn into what the frameworks will cover specifically or how many there will be. What existing common frameworks uh, have you looked at that serve as a model? Well, each of the areas um, is a um, it's slightly uh, 
um, different, and that's that's why uh, we've looked. That, that's why we're undertaking, for example, the the deep dive exercise, so that you have a comparator of areas where there would be that might be considered to be relatively light uh, touch. Forgive uh, me. Maybe I wasn't being clear. Right. What existing common frameworks within the UK, not in relation to EU, uh, common frameworks between the governments of the UK? What examples have you looked at? When, well, we're in we're in the process of of, a, um, of that discussion, but we're not necessarily going to proceed on the basis of of existing a. Uh, can I can I give a suggestion? Uh, so, marine planning, for example, mm -hmm. uh, largely devolved. The different governments sat down, uh, worked together on a memorandum of understanding, uh, deciding what their shared goals mm -hmm. should be what the process should be, then each legislature separately legislated on its own marine act. There was no need for mm -hmm. constraints on mm -hmm. devolved powers, uh, as is being proposed in this legislation. Um, and in fact, the only uh, rebalancing of powers uh, was that UK ministers uh, passed the power for uh, planning in offshore waters further than 12 nautical miles to the Scottish ministers. That mm -hmm. became devolved mm -hmm. uh, when it wasn't before. And the result is... Uh, consistent goals, consistent approach to marine mm -hmm. planning, a common framework, all within the context of existing devolution arrangements. Mm -hmm. Does that not look like the ideal model? I think that's a very good model, and I'm sure that it can apply to some of the areas on the list. The other thing that this approach gives, uh, which the, the potential of what's being, what's being made possible under this bill doesn't, uh, is there's, there's nothing about the transparency of the process of negotiation between two governments to come up with a common framework, the ability for stakeholders, civil society, to contribute to that in a transparent, open and democratic way. Uh, what space do you envisage for that in this process of negotiating common frameworks? I mean, if, if, if I may, I mean, I think both the Scotland office and our own department have been doing a huge amount of stakeholder engagement around these things to listen to the views from civil society, from business groups and from a, you know, a huge range of groups up and down the country. Uh, and in a number of those areas, um, people are pointing towards solutions that may require common frameworks. In a number of other areas, they, they are not. And, and we will certainly take that on board. Um, as we develop our thinking on this and as we you know, go into the discussions around the JMC process. Um, but I think it's important to recognise that actually the, um, the current drafting of Clause 11 would allow for, if there was a, an agreement that a common framework was not required in an area that was returning from the EU, exactly the approach you set out with regard to marine planning. It would allow for an agreement between the governments um, to move forward on that and for the orders in council process um, to then be applied um, to say that um, they, th th there was no need for a legislative common framework in this space. It would allow for that, uh, that approach. It would not require that approach. Uh, and the advantage of having separate legislation in the separate parliaments is that external organisations, uh, individual constituents, can uh, give evidence on the record, in public, uh, that parliamentarians can debate the various amendments and different approaches that might be taken uh, and the whole process is open and democratic rather than uh, a deal between two governments which is potentially and, somewhat open but potentially not and and uh, you know I, I absolutely understand that I think that's something we very much do take on board but to return to the whole purpose of this bill in the first place, this is not about making changes. This, is, this, this bill is about providing continuity and certainty as we exit the European Union. It's very clear there will be a number of areas going forward where devolved legislatures, the UK Parliament, may want to make changes, but that's not what this bill is focused on doing. This bill, this bill is actually about making sure that the statute book functions on the day that we exit, um, that things continue to work, and where there are deficiencies, they are put right. With regard to those future issues where we may want to make changes, it will absolutely be right for, for, for that stakeholder engagement to take effect, for policy to be formed, and for most of that to be delivered um, where, where there are changes in policy through primary legislation with the full scru scrutiny that that involves. If the bill is about ensuring consistency uh, and no change, uh, then some things that would look uh, potentially like things that, that at the moment seem to be discussed under some future common frameworks would be in the face of the bill. Things like the precautionary principle, the polluter pays, pays principle, some of the environmental principles of EU law uh, in the way that it's developed would be on the face of the bill so that they act as constraints 
on ministers in their use, their very powerful use of secondary legislation. Uh, if you want to ensure consistency and no change uh, when the, the bill is passed and when the, the UK withdraws from the European Union, wouldn't those be on the faces of the bill, uh, as well as some answers to Michael Gove's questions about governance uh, in the absence of the EU Commission's uh, enforcement role in relation to environmental law? Uh, I mean, there's a number of different questions there. I think with regard to the jurisprudence and the development of EU law, we're, we're absolutely making sure that the bill takes um, the existing jurisprudence um, of the uh, EU and writes that in so that there will be, um, in the approach to the preservation of the EU law, our courts will have regard to um, those judgments and indeed the seniority of those judgments with regard to the um, EU institutions. So that is in the bill. Um, with regard to um, the, um, the point you make about the environment. This is something that we uh, you know, look at very closely. Um, clearly there are within the UK structure existing mechanisms in that respect, but if there's a need for um, more, it's something that I know that the Deputy Secretary is considering. Does that include placing those environmental principles onto the face of the bill? As I say, I think all the jurisprudence um, of the ECJ and um, the <coughs> approach is absolutely taken into account in the bill, it's written into the bill, but we will be writing that in as we exit, so that, that is there for our courts to, 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 to pay heed to. Uh, clearly what we are doing is ending the jurisdiction uh, of the European Court of Justice as we exit the European Union, because the European Court of Justice is the, the, the senior court of the European Union. Adam. Um, thank you, Camino. So could you say, I just want to go back to the exchange a few minutes ago between um, yourself and, and the convener, um, because I think you made um, a very important point, and I just want to try and ensure that I've understood it. Um, um, and, and what I think you said um, is that you would not expect this place to give its consent to the bill um, until and unless there was agreement um, about how common frameworks will be uh, negotiated, agreed, and policed in the event of disagreement. <coughs> Um, and then there was then a follow-up question about, you know, if, if that is the case, why does the bill say nothing expressly about common frameworks? It seems to me that common frameworks, uh, it seems to me that practically everybody is agreed, and certainly the two governments are agreed, that common frameworks are going to be absolutely central mm -hmm. to the repatriation of powers from the European Union mm -hmm. to the United Kingdom. So j j just piecing all of that together, if I've got mm -hmm. it right, um, you know, we have a very simple and limited job, um, in both in this committee and in this parliament, with regard to this bill. We have to give consent to this bill or not. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we can't give consent to a general theory of common frameworks. We can't give consent to a policy that there should be common frameworks. We have to give consent to this bill. So just pulling all of that together, um, w would I be right in, 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 in reading you as saying that, in your view, this bill will have to make express reference to common frameworks before you can legitimately expect us to consent to it. I didn't say that. I know you didn't. I'm just trying to piece it all together. I did say what you said at the beginning of your <laughs> remarks. I'm try and I'm trying to understand and the consequences of what you I, said. I would also say that as other bills of this nature uh, have been dealt with constitutional bills, there is a reason why the legislative consent process within par this Parliament takes place before the final amending stage of a bill. That is the, that is the convention. So, the, and that's the basis on which I'm proceeding. That that's the point at which a, at which the bill uh, will be considered for Parliament by Parliament for consent. Now. Neither, you know, Mr. Walker and myself would, would show uh, complete contempt for our own Parliament if at this moment we were to suggest uh, that the bill would be exactly the same as it appears now when it got to that process, because we have to respect Parliament and how it might uh, apply uh, it, it, itself to uh, the bill. So it, I, it, I, I, so you know, the, the, it, the, I, and that's why I've made such put such emphasis on the agreeing of uh, the, the process around the frameworks and the areas for frameworks, because they will provide much greater context, and as Mr. Walker says, scope 
um, when we get to uh, the stage at which this Parliament is actually considering the legislative consent motion. Let's just finish this last bit on the frameworks, and then I'll get on to issues of deficiencies in the EU law, which really coffee wants to raise. But so I can say thank you for making it very clear that as far as any process for agreement of the frameworks is concerned, there will have to be an agreement between the Scottish Government and the UK Government in that regard. I understand that, and that was very clear. I'm not so clear, though, what will happen if the content of a framework cannot be agreed and what the process will be to remedy that. It so will have to be it will have, That will have to be agreed as part of that process. Yes, well, that's, I understand that, but I think that's something specifically, because that's something that's emerged a bit more in mm -hmm. discussion today mm -hmm. than previously had been clear to me. It's certainly something specifically this committee, I think, will want to address. We'll probably be writing to you following this meeting, but you can be sure that that specific point will be in, because we need to be confident of whatever that process is, that you know, it is an agreement process at the end of the day that can be shown to be an agreement process, for want of a way to, better way to describe it. But I think that puts it in a nutshell. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener. In, in the, the area of correcting deficiencies in EU law, the Law Society of Scotland has expressed some concern about this conferment of power, powers to ministers, and that, in fact, these could be used to make more wide-ranging changes to policy, perhaps impacting on Scotland significantly. Um, these should be for Parliament to make, surely, and not ministers, as the Bill proposes at the moment. What's the justification for that? Power on deficiencies, this is a clause in seven power, um, is um, you know, very strictly limited to only correcting deficiencies where they arise as a result of our withdrawal from the European Union. We expect most of those to be very technical indeed. This is th things like um, references to other member states, um, references to specific EU institutions and so on and so forth. Uh, and um, you know, this, is, this is a process um, which a number of um, people who've given evidence to various committees in Westminster have, have suggested it is certainly appropriate for secondary legislation. Uh, and where, there is, uh, where they're purely technical, um, we think that would be through the negative procedure. But clearly where there is a policy decision involved, it would be through an affirmative procedure so that there would be um, a, a, a debate on that and uh, a, a response to that. But I don't think we see this, you know, we really don't see, considering the number of um, areas that are required for attention, um, it's not an area where we would want the process to be one of making policy change. It is very much about correcting deficiencies. It is very much about um, ensuring that the law continues to work in the way that it was intended um, previously. Uh, and so, so, so it, it's certainly not our intention, and I don't think it would be actually physically possible um, for um, a, a government to seek to make sweeping policy changes across all these areas in the time we have available. Um, the deficiencies power will only really work if it is very much applied to correcting deficiencies and nothing more than that. But it's still ministerial power, it's not power... Parliament's well, it's, it, it, it's a power to bring forward delegated legislation, which, of course, then has to have um, parliamentary approval. And um, you know, wh where there is um, legislation required at a devolved level, it would obviously go through the appropriate scrutiny processes um, of the devolved legislature. Mm -hmm. I mean, who's actually involved in identifying all these deficiencies? And uh, dare, I, dare I ask, will there be agreement between the governments and parliaments about how these are resolved as well? So, so, so this is an area where, you know, across the whole of government, we've been looking at the body of law, and there has been, uh, you know, a, a great deal of work done on an official level, as you can imagine, to go through the statute book and see where deficiencies may may have to arise. Um, you know, the estimate at a UK level is for between 800 and 1,000 um, statutory instruments to be required to, to deal with that, but we haven't yet seen a precise estimate at the, the, the level of each of the um, devolved uh, administrations, and that's something we will continue to work um, closely with the developed administrations to uh, scope out the, the needs in each of them. But will you seek joint agreement before proceeding with those in the same spirit of the questions that were previously asked here today? I mean, this is an area where you know, I think we're going to have to work closely together to ensure that we have statute books that work in every part of the United Kingdom. And, uh, but but, but you know, I just come back to the fact that the deficiencies... Um, power is very much about making things work, continuing to, to maintaining the continuity in the way that the law works, um, rather than trying to make any policy changes. That's not something uh, we would or could try to do under that power. You could ask specifically about Clause 7. Um, why do the regulations in dealing with those deficiencies in Clause 7 exclude the power to amend or repeal the Northern Ireland Act? 
but they don't exclude the power to amend or repeal the Scotland or Wales Act. Why is that? Um, so it, it, it's a good question. It's a question I was asked the other day at the EU, exiting the EU committee as well. And um, I, across a whole range of legislation, there are references and provisions that wouldn't make sense when we leave the EU. Unlike in other pieces of legislation, which would predominantly be corrected using the powers in the bill through secondary legislation, we recognise that the standing of the three devolution acts um, is very important. Uh, and that's why the bill corrects as many deficiencies as possible on the face of the bill. If you look at um, the uh, Schedule 3, Section 2, um, we go through each of the three key devolution acts and set out where we see those deficiencies um, right now. It does retain a correcting power to the Wales and Scotland Act, and this is limited only to correcting deficiencies, and it's provided as a contingency to prevent creating gaps in the statute book. The Northern Ireland Act, because it is the main statutory manifestation of the Belfast Agreement agreed by the UK Government and the Irish Government, um, any changes to that beyond those which are already set out in the Schedules Bill would be have, to, have to be delivered um, by primary legislation. Okay. Neil? Yeah, just on the issue uh, of Northern Ireland, we know there's 111 areas of overlap um, in Scotland affecting EU law, 64 in Wales. Is there a number for areas affecting Northern Ireland? There is, but I'm afraid I don't have it to hand. And um, it, is a, it is a large number because of the scope of the, the, the Northern Ireland Act and the legislation there. Apologies for not having that in front of me, but uh, could, I wouldn't, I'm not going to try and remember it off the top of my head. Could you maybe write to us? Very happy to write back to you with that, yes, absolutely. Thank you. On the issue of secondary legislation, there's one thing which I've beavered away on, and that's in regard to where we have a situation where the UK government or Parliament passes um, secondary legislation that changes primary legislation in Scotland in terms of the devolved settlement. There is currently no process available to the Scottish Parliament to be able to consent to that, unlike where, where there is a Sewell process for the primary legislation that might change primary legislation. Now, under Clause 11, we could see, sorry, Clause 7, we could see significant numbers of amendments come forward that potentially amend primary legislation, devolved legislation in Scotland. Do you not think we should have some sort of process in place that allows us to deal with that, that's similar at least to Sewell? Well, I'm quite happy to uh, to look at that. I understand that the, the point uh, that, that you're making in uh, that regard. I mean, what we have committed to do is to work both with the Scottish Government and uh, with this Parliament, in fact, as well, because of the, 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 the scale of, of activity that might be required. In a, you know, in, in a consensual uh, way, but I, un I understand the specific point that you make in relation uh, to Parliament, and let, let's take that back and have a look at it. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a, 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 some t small time in, in the bank. Patrick, you wanted to raise a slightly wider issue in regard to the EU withdrawal bill and the process. Um. Well, certainly it's it's connected. The, there's been, as you'll be aware, a great deal of uh, discussion about the impact that uh, this whole process will have on our society and our economy. Uh, a great many people, individuals, families, businesses, uh, are uh, experiencing a, a dearth of information and a great deal of uncertainty. Uh, and uh, it appears that the UK government has conducted uh, impact assessments on various sectors of the economy. Uh, I think the number generally floated is 58 sectoral impact assessments. Um, the two of you, a DEXU minister and a, a Secretary of State, may be amongst the very, very small number of people who actually know what exists uh, and in what level of detail. For example, uh, uh, David Davis two weeks ago uh, told uh, the Committee of the House of Commons, that the Prime Minister had seen the summary outcomes, uh, but had not necessarily read every single one. They are in excruciating detail. Uh, and then yesterday, uh, I think it was yesterday, uh, he uh, said, it is not the case that 58 sectoral impact assessments exist. So was Mr Davis right when he said they are in excruciating detail, or was Mr Davis right when he said they don't exist? 
I, I think I ought to answer that one first. Um, I, I think um, there is a huge amount of analysis, as you'll appreciate. And what we set out, and uh, I set out first in a debate um, when we were debating Opposition Day motion about a week and a half ago, and my colleague Steve Baker reiterated um, to the House yesterday, um, is that the, this information does not exist in exactly the form which has been requested. Um, that, which are sexual economic impact assessments. Um, but, but we have done a very broad sexual analysis. Um, uh, uh, and as you say, that, that we published to the House Lords EU Committee uh, the headings under which that is um, done, which covers 58 sectors and a number of cross-cutting uh, regulatory issues. Um, the motion that um, the House of Commons has approved um, requires us to um, share that information um, with the exiting the EU Select Committee. And as my colleague made clear uh, yesterday, we are making sure that the information is in the correct format, um, that it can be uh, shared there. We are under a number of different obligations here. Um, the House has voted a number of times that we shouldn't be publishing anything which is prejudicial to our negotiating position. Um, we also have a legal obligation not to publish anything which isn't in the um, public interest. Um, and we also have legal obligations when it comes to uh, confidentiality. Um, but we are working to ensure that information is available. And I think the other point, which I know um, David can um, touch on, is um, we have already been discussing the sectoral analysis which has been conducted in the format of JMC. Yes. Some summaries clearly exist because Mr. Davis said they've been given to the Prime Minister. Will I, they be published? I think the summaries that he was referring to um, were at, a, at an early stage of the analysis when our department was first set up and this information was commissioned. Um, what we've said since then is that you know, this has been regularly updated. All government departments are engaged in the process of looking at the opportunities, um, the risks um, through this process and how they can be mitigated. And so that analysis will take some time to, uh, to, to, to fully compile. Um, but I think w what we absolutely will be doing um, is ensuring that uh, our policy with regard to um, the future relationship with the EU, as well as our withdrawal, uh, is informed by the best analysis across the board. You'll never be at a point where uh, waiting another month and doing some more work won't give you more detailed analysis. Uh, at some point, you're going to have to publish. When will you publish and what will it be? What we've been asked to do at this stage is to provide information to a select committee of the House of Commons. We've made clear that that will be done within three weeks. Within three weeks. And presumably that will also be available to this Parliament. I think we need to agree with the select committee of the House of Commons the terms on which that information is going to be provided. Um, we will certainly then be looking at um, what can be done with regard to other parliaments and um, you know, we, we will seek to uh, ensure that um, whatever information can be provided within our legal constraints um, is brought forward. Okay, that's, I, think, I think we've gone far enough on that, Patrick. Can I, can I thank Mr Mundell and Mr Walker for coming along today? We've covered a lot of ground for that. I'm very welcome. Um, before the final amending stage of the Lords, we'll have to com you know, complete another, our final report. Uh, <coughs> therefore, I think it's pro more than likely that we will be looking for UK government representatives to appear before us again before that before that process. Um, I hope you'll be able to give us some level of commitment to do that. Um, um, and I think I'll now suspend this meeting for 10 minutes to allow change over witnesses. Thank you very much for coming today. <laughs>
Okay, uh, the second item on today's agenda is to consider the Scottish Statutory Instrument which provides for the 2017 autumn budget revision. Uh, before we come to the actual motion itself, seeking our approval at agenda item three, we'll have an evidence taken session on the order. We are joined for this session by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Constitution, who is accompanied by two officials, Bill Stitt and Scott Mackay. Cabinet Secretary, I ask you if you want to make an opening statement. Okay, thank you, uh, Convener, and uh, good morning. The autumn budget revision provides the first of two opportunities to formally amend the Scottish budget for 2017 18. In order to assist the committee with the scrutiny, I've provided a brief guide to the autumn budget revision prepared by my officials. That guide sets out the background to and the details of the main changes proposed, and I hope that the committee has found this guide to be helpful. This year's autumn budget revision deals with four different types of amendments to the budget. Firstly, a couple of funding changes. Secondly, a few technical adjustments that have no impact on spending power. Thirdly, a couple of Whitehall transfers. And finally, some budget neutral transfers of resources between portfolio budgets. The net impact of all of these changes is an increase in the approved budget of £19 million, from £39,300,000 million to £39,319,000. Million. Table 1.1 on page 4 of the supporting document shows the approved budgets following the changes sought in the autumn budget revision. The supporting document to the autumn budget revision and the brief guide prepared by my officials provide background on the net changes. The first set of changes comprise the deployment of financial transactions to support the Scottish Growth Fund, offset by a transfer to central resources from the Coastal Communities Fund to be held until required. In total, these changes increased the budget by £7.7 .7 million. The second set of changes comprise a few technical adjustments to the budget. The technical adjustments are non-cash and therefore budget neutral, as they cannot be redeployed to support discretionary spend elsewhere and have a net positive impact of £6.3 million on the overall aggregate position. It is necessary to reflect these adjustments to ensure the budget is consistent with the accounting requirements and with the final outturn that will be reported in our annual accounts. The Scottish Budget aligns with the accounting requirements under the Government Financial Reporting Manual. And accordingly, the uh, budget provision is included within the Scottish budget for the financial year to reflect the recognition of relevant assets with revenue finance infrastructure schemes in accordance with the accounting requirements. The adjustment to the budget at this autumn budget revision is £9.9 .9 million. Other technical adjustments are a transfer of £1 million to the judicial salaries budget, which sits outside the budget approved by the Scottish Parliament a £2 million transfer of non-cash budget from the National Records of Scotland to Historic Environment Scotland, and a couple of minor adjustments to allow Skills Development Scotland and the Risk Management Authority to uh, access uh, cash uh, reserves. With regard to the Whitehall transfers and allocations from HM Treasury, there's a net positive impact on the budget of £5.2 million in relation to the Coastal Communities Fund and the Edinburgh Cultural Summit. The final part of the budget revision concerns the transfer of funds within and between portfolios to better align the budgets with profiled spend. In line with past years, there's a number of internal portfolio transfers which have no effect on portfolio totals, but ensure that internal budgets are monitored and managed effectively. The main transfers between portfolios are noted in the SBR supporting document in the guide to the SBR. As we move towards the financial year end, we'll continue in line with our normal practice to monitor, forecast, outturn against budget. And wherever possible, we'll seek to utilise any emerging underspends to ensure we make optimum use of the resources available in 2017-18 and to proactively manage the flexibility provided under the fiscal framework agreement between HM Treasury and the Scottish Government. And I shall be providing the committee with a mid-year report on the revenue and spending to date alongside the spring budget revision when published to improve transparency of the budget management process and the decisions I take in year in line with the budget process review group recommendations. Also in response to the recommendations of the budget process review group on transparency of budget information, two new tables have been added to this year's supporting documents on page 8 showing the sources of funding that support the changes applied and the movement of available resources, and I hope members find these useful. Thank, Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I know Neil Bibby had a question. It was just um, 
you mentioned uh, briefly the, the um, cash reserves issue, allowing bodies uh, to access cash reserves, and you mentioned Skills Development Scotland, and I think it's also the Risk Management Authority. Can you tell us a bit more about, about... Do you want to expand on that, Scott? This is, this is a technical adjustment, and it's about the source of funding, the source of cash for these bodies. So it's not going to affect the overall spending of the body, it's just the split of the cash that they will utilise across the year from um, Scottish Government and what they're using from the reserves. So because they're accessing the reserves, we're reducing the amount of funding that um, we're providing them. But their overall spend in the year will be the same. Okay. Uh, th thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. There, there's in the uh, list of portfolio transfers, there's a sum of £55 million being transferred from health and sport to education and skills for midwifery uh, education. It's clearly quite a substantial uh, sum of money. Um, this is a transfer that's appeared in the autumn budget revision uh, in every year since 2008-9. And given that this is now happening on an annual basis, would it not make more sense for the sum just to be incorporated into the health and sport budget when you publish your draft budget for the year rather than doing an annual revision in autumn of every year? I, I think there's a, a valid point in that, but it, it comes back to, a, Mr Fraser's correct, there has been a practice that a portfolio ultimately with responsibility can, can determine that resource, indeed be a beneficiary if there's savings in that uh, line as well, and that has been the position. Uh, in terms of the line. So it's a portfolio with responsibility transferring to um, a, another um, portfolio. And that's certainly a significant example of that, but it has been consistent with previous years. Um, sometimes, of course, at the start of the financial year, there might not be absolute clarity on what that figure would be. And as they, that uh, figure's developed over the course of time, then there's that certainty which allows me to bring it to the autumn budget revision. But Mr Fraser's correct, there could be a, uh, a process where you transfer it all into uh, another portfolio. But in essence, it's continuing that practice, which is not exclusive to that line, uh, where uh, <coughs> the portfolio with responsibility then makes a determination. I mean, th th thanks for that answer. I mean, I think that the, the point behind this really is that by doing it in this way, you are um, inflating the size of the health budget and deflating the size of the uh, education and skills budget at the point that your draft budget is produced. I just wonder if, for the purposes of, of clarity and transparency, it would be better just to permanently put the spending in the uh, education and skills budget. Uh, I would say again, I, mean, I understand uh, the uh, analysis, but there is a principle around a portfolio with responsibility, essentially commissioning that from another portfolio in the environment that therefore happens. I mean, there'll be some uh, cross-portfolio uh, transactions work, of course, both ways as well, um, but essentially that has been the established practice and I'm being consistent um, with that, of course, there could be an overall budget realignment, but say there's many budget lines where the principle applies uh, that the portfolio with responsibility um, transfers the resource to another portfolio and ultimately health would be the beneficiary of any savings in this line, if there were any. Okay. James. Okay. Uh, thanks, convener. Uh, in the, the list of technical adjustments, there are two uh, changes in relation to IFR. IFRS accounting requirements in order to bring them in line with the, the Scottish year end budget. Uh, you know, 4.9 million in relation to prisons and 5.5 .5 million uh, relating to motorway and trunk roads. Can you maybe give a bit of background as to why, why that was made? Okay, I'll ask uh, Scott Mackay to come in on that. This is about differences in the way that certain, um, certain um, examples of these contracts are treated against. Um, treasury budgets and are disclosed in our accounts. So um, the, the, the treatment is different there. In the Scottish budget, we need to approve um, an allocation that aligns with that accounting treatment, so we need to make these technical adjustments. As um, Mr Mackay referred to in his opening statement, they don't um, increase our spending power. They're only about the, the, the way the accounting requirements um, 
mean that we need to show show the um, these contracts in our accounts. So why has the change got to be, be made now and that's not been able to be reflected when the budget was drawn up? Because there are um, adjustments in year reflecting the um, movement on these, uh, these contracts that aren't precisely clear at the, at the draft budget period. So you, you'll be aware at the budget bill itself there are technical adjustments that are shown that are um, in line with this, and this is this is movements in year against those contracts in the accounting disclosure. So does that mean that the values in the contracts have increased during the course of the year? It, it can it can be um, a movement in the asset values that are reflected in the accounts. So d just to take the the prisons one as an example, which was four point nine million pounds, um, are you saying that there's been some increase? in relation to asset values uh, linked to prison infrastructure projects? It's, it's an adjustment to the carrying value in the accounts. So obviously that varies over time. The, 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 way, the way that asset is reflected in the accounts it will be depreciated across, across the year. So, so, the, so the net carrying value in the accounts will change um, and, and that adjustment can reflect that. So what actually was the adjustment? Is it an adjustment because the asset value has increased or an adjustment because the depreciation policy or the depreciation value has changed? Um, sorry, bear with me a second. It's quite a detailed question. can't find it just now. Yeah. Okay, if yeah. you're right. Yeah, the right yeah. I think, um, you know, I, um, I, I, it's, not a, it's not a point that would lead to the opposition of the order, but I, I'm keen to understand, it's you know, we're talking about yeah, reasonable yeah. sums of money here, £10 yeah. million, pounds, and I'm keen to understand yeah. why those values have increased. I and if got there now. But I, I think it's important to, to be clear that it's not a change in the underlying contract. This is, this is about... Um, so, so the, the actual payments from the um, from the prison um, service to to the contractor are not changing as a result of these. It, it is purely about the accounting disclosure. I, I understand what you're saying, and it's, a ch it's to do with a change in the accounting the, the accounting disclosure, and that's that was what was said in the note that were provided, yeah. but. I'm still not clear as to what it actually was, so maybe if yeah. the officials could write to us. Yeah, well, I listen, I think the best we just write to us and let us yeah. know what that would come. I think Indeed, James is quite right to ask that question. So, no other questions? Okay, in that case, um, we now move to agenda item three, which is consideration of the motion on the order. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move motion S5M08385 that the Finance and Constitution Committee recommends that the Budget Scotland Act 2017 Amendment Regulations 2017 Draft be approved. I move. Thank you. I now put the question. The question is that motion mm -hmm. S5M08385 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're agreed. In that case, the committee will publish a short report to the Parliament setting out our decision <coughs> on the order. And I thank the committee. I now close this meeting of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you.